don't want to get there. We're enjoying Passover. Um, yeah, so it's Friday. Yeah. 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 So we're especially proud uh, to welcome Jennifer Roski tonight. She's a native Montrealer now living in Jerusalem. Uh, Ms. Roski is, is pursuing her PhD at Bar Ilan University in Gender Studies, examining the intersection between the multiple identities of Jewish women in North America and Israel as women, Jews, and feminists who are senior members of faculty and academic institutions of their respective countries. She holds a BA from Brandeis University in Near Eastern and Judaic Studies and a master's degree from Harvard University in Counseling Psychology. She's worked in development and communications capacities at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel's Ministry of Foreign Relations, the Interdisciplinary Center of Herzliya, the Mandel Foundation, and she's currently working with the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, an important think tank in Jerusalem. She's also been a research consultant with ISGAP since its inception. Her publications include Marginalization and Its Discontents, American Jews, Multicultural and Identity Studies, Missing from the Map, Feminist Theory, and American Jewish Women. And today she'll continue the discussion on multiculturalism and identity with a lecture on multiculturalism, Jewish marginalization, and gender. It's a very great pleasure to welcome Jennifer Roskies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I thought uh, there was going to be a, a microphone, so I'm internalizing my mother saying, speak up, speak up. So <laughs> if you can't hear me, just uh, let me know and I'll speak up a little more. It's a very, very special pleasure to be here today, and I thank all of you who took the trouble to come. Uh, let me express special thanks to ISGAP, and particularly to Charles Small, for the kind invitation to speak here today to Katie Jo Junkis, Michelle Whiteman, and Bria for coordinating all of the logistics to make this happen. It's also very significant to me <clears throat> to be speaking about the topic of multiculturalism here in Canada, where multiculturalism as an ideal and a national policy first took root in ways that have had admirable results, certainly in their initial incarnation, in ways that could and have served as models for the rest of the Western world. While the bulk of the research that follows, which you'll hear today, is based on American sources, you can also consider, consider the degree to which it applies to the Canadian and the uniquely Montreal experience as well. This talk opens with a look at a curious area of omission in the drive to understand Jewish identity, namely, <clears throat> namely its exclusively inward-looking focus of looking at Jews with next to no literature that explores Jewish characteristics in the context of Jewish impact on American society at large. We'll then look at, the, at a mirror image of this omission that exists in scholarship on multicultural identity summarized in historian David A. Hollinger's observation, quote, the key point about multiculturalism is that there has been almost no place in it for Jews. We will also see that this omission certainly pertains to Jewish women when it comes to research in feminist identity studies. Part two of this talk puts forward where this research reticence may have originated, going back to American academia in the decades following World War II, when today's senior scholars were embarking upon their academic careers. We will also note an intriguing parallel development of how American Jews in both academic and public life generated the very language that helped present Jews to America, enabling greater entrance and acceptance. Yet the omission of Jews, women and men, from American multicultural studies research leaves a gap in our understanding of American modernity, as well as in a fuller understanding of American and North American Jewry. Can everybody hear? Okay. <clears throat> when it's good for the Jews, it's bad for Judaism. This saying encapsulates the notion that the unprecedented freedom which served Jewish emigrants to America and their descendants so well has come at a price. We all know of the data that point to trends in American Jewry that suggest population decline. 
These findings have prompted numerous responses, including a concerted drive to research the state of Jewish identity. The driving motivation behind much of this research is a concern with Jewish survival in the face of not anti-Semitism or persecution, but the welcoming environment of American pluralistic society. The overall objective of these studies, whether stated or implicit, is the search of prescriptions to secure American Jewry's future. Recent decades have also seen a surge of academic inquiry in the fields of identity and multicultural theory, which have become among the most extensively studied constructs in the social sciences and historical research. Multicultural research examines issues related to identity in a range of forms, individual identity, collective identity, multiple identities, cultural identity, ethnic, gender, occupational, national, narrative, social, and more. So, considering the imperative nature of research on Jewish identity, the goal of bolstering the future of American Jewry, one might think that scholars' examination of this topic would, would leave no stone unturned. Yet despite volumes of, res of valuable research, which has looked at emerging indicators of Jewish behaviors, attitudes, and affiliations, while weighing what they may portend for American Jewry's numbers and resilience, there are certain areas of om omission due to which we lack a cohesive overall picture. One of these blind spots concerns much of Jewish identities studies overwhelmingly inward orientation, as I mentioned in the introduction, overlooking what Deborah Kaufman referred to as the subjective byproduct of social location. Namely, we lack research on the context of Jewish identity within the American non-Jewish mainstream. To David A. Hollinger, this inward view typifies what he termed a communalist perspective, meaning what he called an emphasis on the his, uh, an emphasis on the history of communal Jewry, including the organizations and institutions that proclaim Jewishness, and the activities of individuals who identify themselves as Jewish and or are so identified by non-Jews with the implication that it somehow matters. This, as opposed to the dispersionist approach Hollinger advocated, in order to rectify the disparity and to understand what he saw as the demographic overrepresentations of Jews in the American worlds of finance, film, science, psychoanalysis, philanthropy, entertainment, political radicalism, modernist movements, the arts, and other domains of modernity. He explained, by dispersionist, I refer to a more expanded compass that takes fuller account of the lives in any and all domains of persons with an ancestry in the Jewish diaspora, regardless of their degree of involvement with communal Jewry, and no matter what their extent of declared or described Jewishness. The skills promoted by the conditions of the European diaspora surely help explain many kinds of Jewish success. A large swath of American popular and professional discourse was led by people who carried Jewish cultural baggage with them in their creative careers, whether or not they identified themselves as Jews. This broadened framework of study, he claims, is in the interest of understanding both the overrepresentation and underrepresentation of different descent groups, an approach also adopted by Yuri Sleskin, for example, who in his book, The Jewish Century, put forward the case that skills honed by centuries of life in the European diaspora paved the way for unprecedented Jewish impact over the course of the 20th century in America and elsewhere. The dispersionist perspective that Hollinger advocated rejects the more common course we might recognize as avoidance due to a perception that direct examination would invite anti-Semitic inferences. But rather than opening the door to theories of Jewish domination or Jewish genius, Hollinger says, the grounds for this reticence diminish if not disappear if these statistics can be explained by taking full account of the conditions under which the various descent groups have been shaped. 
avoiding the forthright historical and social scientific study of the question, perpetuates the mystification of Jewish history and subtly refuels the idea that the answer is really biological and will serve to reinforce invidious distinctions between dissent groups. <clears throat> Turning his attention to multicultural studies, Hollinger pointed to a vacuum that is a mirror image of the communalist dispersionist dichotomy. The key point about multiculturalism, I mentioned this quote earlier, the key point about multiculturalism is that there has been almost no place in it for Jews. Mainstream scholarship has been slow to recognize and appreciate Jewish history in relation to the larger prehistory and history of cultural diversity in America. One might think that this story, the impact of groups of Jews, would attract the attention of mainstream historians interested in the idea of identity formation and cultural diversity, which has been such a huge preoccupation of American historians for the last 40 years. Instead, Hollinger contended that scholarship in multicultural identity studies has discounted American Jews due to what he called an ethno-racial manner of mapping cultural diversity, which he dated back to the 1970s, the late 1970s, saying, <clears throat> Jews were ignored since the main point of multiculturalism was color and Jews were white. And a second point of multiculturalism was inequality and Jews were doing very well. So cool it, the collegiate message was, let these multicultural studies programs deal with the needs of Americans color-coded in contrast to the white demographic bloc. It bears recalling here that Jews have only recently come to be considered white. Race has been a remarkably fluid form of categorization over the past centuries, with some referring to racial categorization as a social construct. As historian Sander Gilman noted, for the 18th and 19th century scientist, the blackness of the Jew was taken as fact and as mark of racial inferiority in addition to an indicator, an indicator of his diseased nature. By mid-century, mid-19th century, being black, being Jewish, being diseased, and being ugly came to be inexorably linked. One bore the signs of one's diseased status on one's anatomy and by extension in one's psyche. Literature documenting race in America dates the designation of Jews as white as recently in, as the 1920s or following World War II. With the awareness of Nazi Germany's racial policies and resulting horror, the 1940s produced a profound revision in the, tax <coughs> in the taxonomy bless you, of the world's races. This is reflected in examples such as Arthur Miller's 1945 novel Focus, or Laura Z. Hobson's 1947 Gentleman's Agreement, later adapted into the film starring Gregory Peck, whose message was that Jews are not only difficult to tell apart from non-Jews, but that their similarity to real Americans reflects their essential worthiness of racial equality as well. Expanding the definition of whiteness brought obvious benefits to Jews within American society. This identification with mainstream white America positioned American Jewry to attain greater financial security and power during the second half of the 20th century. At the same time, in sources much more recent than the 1940s, Jews are described as not quite white or a different shade of white. In other words, not quite blending in. A 1993 study involving white American women on the subject of their white identities by Ruth Frankenberg noted statements by Jewish participants indicating that several points must be made about the intersection of Jewishness and whiteness. Ashkenazi Jews for much of this century in the US and Europe have been placed at the borders of whiteness, at, some, at times viewed as cultural outsiders, at times as racial outsiders, but in any case never as constitutive of the cultural norm. Frankenberg's study is revealing in other ways as well. In the relatively short section she devoted to the Jewish aspect of those women among her participants who were Jews, 
the theme of experiencing anti-Semitism arose among every single one of them. Frankenberg picked up on statements by the Jewish women in her interviews, which described their senses of identity as Jews over different stages in their lives, calling into question the ethno-racial mapping Hollinger cited that excluded the experience of American Jews as a topic worthy of attention in its own right within mainstream research. When it comes to Jewish women, consistent with Hollinger's observations, the intersection of their identities goes unnoticed within the general field of identity studies. When it comes to research examining gender identity, feminist, and multicultural identity, Jewish women are practically absent as case studies. Such multiple exclusions, as Sarah R. Horowitz termed them, stand in marked contrast to the considerable literature in black feminist theory and that of other racial and ethnic groups. The omission of Jewish women from general multicultural research appears particularly curious in light of Jewish women's contributions to the feminist movement in the United States, both as activists and as leading theorists. Hollinger, in fact, cited the feminist movement as a prime example of the lacunae he observed in multicultural research. Despite the over, the quote, despite the overrepresentation of Jewish women among the ranks of its leaders by how many thousand percentage points, he noted, our scholarly and popular histories take virtually no notice of this astronomically huge demographic fact. Research asking, in what sense is women's liberation a Jewish story, Hollinger claimed, likening it to the way scholarship has explored the role of Protestantism in the abolitionist and civil rights movements, would help streamline American Jewish history's integration into mainstream American history. Among rare examples of academic studies to examine the interface of identities for Jews within their non-Jewish social location is Joyce, Joyce Antler's documentation of radical feminism and Jewish women, illustrating a redeeming approach. Revealingly, the movement leaders she interviewed had disregarded the possible association between being, being Jewish at the time of their activism during the 1960s and 70s at the height of second wave feminism. Only much more recently, and in retrospect, had they begun to assert its relevance. Dina Pinsky added dimension to this chapter of history in her 2010 study interviewing 30 Jews, most of them women, on the subject of their Jewish identities and their involvement as activists in the women's movement during the same period. To provide another telling example of this point, when subjects in Deborah Kaufman's study expressed sentiments to the effect that their identity as Jewish women, quote, is grounded in their experience as the other within Judaism, unquote, it spoke directly to the experience of being a Jewish woman vis-a-vis -vis Jewish men, as well as vis-a-vis -vis the greater world's perception of the Jew as other. These four studies, Frankenberg's, Antler's, Pinsky's, and Kaufman's provide isolated examples of how much more may be gleaned in a more thorough probing of the intersection of Jewish women's identities. Their observations call attention to the material yet to be mined by studying the interface of Jewish identities within American society in multicultural identity literature. Now I'm coming to the second part which I call Jews in American Academia, a tacit footprint. If the rarity of research on Jewish women within mainstream multicultural research on the American feminist movement appears paradoxical, American Jewish scholars' failure to get Jews on the standardized multicultural map of the United States, despite the heavy demographic overrepresentation of Jews in the cultural industries, including academia, is all the more paradoxical. The reason for this block may stem in part from what Alan M. Kraut recalled as the chilling effect of an American academia in the post-war period as still rife with anti-Semitism. In the aftermath of the war, he writes, unabashed Jew haters in the academy needed to keep more of a lid on their attitudes when speaking publicly. <clears throat> 
However, graduate students with professional aspirations still often hesitated to select a dissertation topic that identified them as Jewish. Wise doctoral mentors took care to counsel against a topic that typecast the young aspiring academic as too Jewish. Even those committed to writing history saw Jews had an uphill battle. Jews specializing in American history had a particularly difficult time getting jobs, observed historian Edward Shapiro. Historians were reluctant to entrust the, te the teaching of the nation's sacred history to such outsiders. Examples of this aversion were given voice in my own dissertation research when American Jewish women, all senior members of faculty in the humanities or social sciences, described the process of choosing their field of academic research. Many upheld this unwritten rule, spurning Jewish themes as a given, some stating pointedly that choosing such a focus would have been akin to opting for separatism as opposed to the career they sought in the mainstream. As a professor of American studies at Stanford University recalled her decision to me to forego a dissertation topic related to Yiddish, if you viewed yourself as someone who wanted to live and work in an integrated environment, it really was not a very viable option. But taking that intellectual drive and channeling it into the secular arena and excelling in the bastions of American learning, that was something we Jewish graduate students in the Ivy League could handle. A professor of English literature and women's studies at Berkeley articulated to me the same sense of mutual exclusivity between Jewish topics and mainstream research when she spoke of the course syllabi she had developed on women, race, and ethnicity in which it never once occurred to her to include a Jewish perspective, saying, I know of no one, certainly no one here at the university who teaches Jewish women writers or even Jewish writers, and that may be a coincidence. It may also have to do with a concern about ghettoization. I'm not sure I would want to identify myself or be identified as someone circumscribed by a Jewish identification. Now we come to the intriguing parallel development. In contrast to the above trend of demarcation between mainstream academia and Jewish topics, Lila Corwin Berman, in her 2009 book, Speaking of Jews, traced a very different development over the same general period, a phenomenon which functioned indirectly and almost surely inadvertently in countering marginalization. During the second half of the 20th century, Jews in academia, along with Jewish leaders, rabbis, and intellectuals, quote, sought to navigate, sought to generate a public language of presenting Jews to the United States as a means of navigating relationships with non-Jews within an open yet non-Jewish society. By creating this intellectual framework, Berman noted, Jewish leaders strove to make Jewishness intelligible to the American public. When properly conceived, she noted, a public language of Jewishness, instead of marking Jews as outside or peripheral to American life, enabled Jewish leaders to define Jews as indispensable to the United States. Berman described the intensive involvement of Jews within the academy, particularly the social sciences, and their active role in creating both the theories and the very language of academic discourse. The Jewish attraction to the social sciences, she writes, was a response to the particular circumstances of minority and Jewish life. Sociology offered minority groups an opportunity to integrate their experience in, into larger national contexts. Sociological language and models became unrivaled sources of authority, sculpting the public language that American Jewish leaders used to talk about Jewishness. The fact that Jews helped mold the field of sociology is critical to understanding why sociological language became so useful in Jews' efforts to explain themselves to the United States. In other words, to Berman, part of what secured American Jews' entrance and acceptance into academic life was the terminology they themselves crafted within emerging academic disciplines. Still, countering these gains are the gaps to which Hollinger pointed. For when it came to American Jewry as the subject, 
of academic research, the communalist emphasis on the one hand, and the marginalized, marginalization of Jews from mainstream topics on the other, allowed the narratives of Jewish history and American Jewish history to remain mutually exclusive. Yet what of, <clears throat> what of the parallel effect he described that large swath of American popular and professional discourse led by people of Jewish ancestry or people who carried Jewish cultural baggage with them in their creative careers? How may this influence have disseminated into the, into the American public sphere at large? An excerpt from the interview with the Stanford professor, quoted above, provides an example of how her contributions to academic discourse may have incorporated elements of her Jewish identity as she construed it. Descri describing her current academic venture, an international journal, she wondered, the journal has been a really fruitful area that I've gone into. Do I find this congenial because being Jewish makes me somehow more cosmopolitan focused or something? She surmised, I can't really say that I've had a sustained commitment to Jewish topics or Jewish intellectual concerns in my work, but in a sense, I like to feel that by doing the kind of scholarship that I do and by being both kind of bold and careful and trying to move things in fresh directions, I'm somehow carrying on in Jewish intellectual <coughs> traditions, in Jewish intellectual traditions, even though it's in the secular realm. I'd like to think that. So we see that the mid-20th century pressures to which Kraut referred, where wise doctoral mentors curtailed their Jewish protégés academic areas of focus to exclude Jewish topics, imposed a doctrine of mutual exclusivity. The above interview excerpts reflect the kind of ingrained constraints that shaped academic careers, as well as the fields of multicultural and identity research. Yet the excerpts also suggest that the public language of Jewishness, to which Berman referred, yet the excerpts also suggest that public language of Jewishness, to which Berman referred, expressing that their secular areas of research may carry on Jewish intellectual traditions, indicates the degree to which Jewish academics' work may implicitly carry blueprints rooted in the Jewish experience, elements traceable, to, traceable within their scholarship and ultimately into the public sphere beyond. The absence of Jews as subjects within mainstream academic research relates sharply, relates sharply with another form of invisibility, that of Jewish women within the academic literature of feminist theory. As we saw, the marginalization of Jews stemmed from a barely concealed, often baldly anti-Semitic aversion communicated to researchers setting out on their academic careers. A concurrent development we saw was American Jews leading contribution to social science theory and terminology, molding the very field, in Berman's words, and thus enabling them to define Jews as indispensable to the United States. Perhaps ironically, the very fact of being defined into the mainstream, coupled with the prescribed color-coded cultural typologies, which Hollinger described, may have swayed American Jewish feminists from developing distinct theoretical models and epistemological standpoints akin to black feminists. Any perceived inclinations to do so were, pardon the pun, whitewashed. Yet the absent feminist Jewish standpoint has signaled an element of homelessness, both theoretically and in actual reality. The late Paula Hyman observed that unarticulated and unnamed perspectives result in social, psychological, and spiritual malaise, as well as in vulnerability. I will borrow the feminist literary scholar Elaine Showal Showalter's image from her landmark essay, Feminist Criticism in the Wilderness. Without a theoretical basis, Jewish women have remained, in her terms, an empirical orphan in the theoretical storm, rendering Jewish women's sense of belonging within the mainstream of the movement as ticklish, if not tenuous. In truth, the experience of feeling like a cultural outsider <coughs> or other 
noted in Frankenberg's and Kaufman's studies, is far from uncommon. Jewish targeted enmity of these two, Jewish targeted enmity often takes the, fir the form of anti-Zionism and hostility to Israel. The interconnected nature of these two bigot bigotries demonstrated by Ed Kaplan and Charles Small. In certain circles, in the academic world and beyond, the option of being a feminist and a supporter of Israel is rendered mutually incompatible, a contradiction in terms. Bereft of theoretical belonging or anchor, not even loyal, committed, and radical feminists are exempt from bias, anti-Semitic innuendo, and slurs. To conclude, as we've seen, the ethno-racial mapping described by Holliger, which defined American Jewry as part of the white mainstream culture, complemented the Jewish reticence he cited, the reticence to call attention to their own overrepresentation in so many facets of American life. The effect of omission of Jews from multicultural and identity research as case studies in their own right leaves a gap in our understanding of American modernity. As in the case of Jewish women's absence from feminist theory, it leaves Jews, women, and men ill-equipped to address the not-quite-white status that remains unexplored and unarticulated. If the aim of studying Jewish identity is to channel understanding into securing American and North American Jewry's future, and if the aim of multicultural identity and feminist research is to shed light on how individuals of different racial and ethnic groups, including Jewish women and men, negotiate their respective standpoints, the time for addressing the gaps in academic research is long overdue. Heeding Hollinger's call to decipher matters such as to what degree is women's liberation a Jewish story, future studies can aim to trace the Jewish story within different academic canons and thus shed light on its impact on developments both within academia and beyond in this past century. By the same token, additional study to trace the American, the multicultural, or the feminist story within the life stories of American Jews would stand to add valuable dimension to what we would learn of their Jewish identities, the course of their development, as well as, well as where anti-Semitism's impact was salient. Such study will move toward integrating Jewish and mainstream research, adding dimension with which to understand more fully the American and North American Jewish experience. Thanks. There's a term, uh, visible minorities. I can think of many. Uh, mobility challenge, hearing challenge, uh, visually challenge, mm -hmm. skin color, so you have Asian, African, Hispanic, there are many. So I thought, who are the non-visible minorities? And I can think of only one. Jews are non-visible minorities. Mm -hmm. So therefore, talking about visible minorities, which is everybody, is specifically excluding Jews from it. It's an anti-Semitic term to start with. Okay. Interesting point. Interesting point, Claire. Um, you mentioned Ashkenazim in your study. I'm wondering if you're dealing with Spartan as well, or any study that you're doing dealing with women. The stu this stu my own study looked your exclusively study. at senior academic Jewish women who were born between 1935 and 1955, and, and, and in, in both uh, Israel and America. There are many Sephardic women now in the academia, but not at that age group. Not that, not that I found in them. Um, okay. for, the, for the next, uh, the next dissertation of the of the younger blog, <coughs> they'll show up. She's first. Mm -hmm. Bria. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, what are the issues that you're looking Gender studies program or, or in ephemeral cultural studies. Right, 
say it's everywhere, not, yeah. anywhere and everywhere. But uh, there's and there's so many um, there, there's so many areas of focus one could choose. There's there's lots of room for exploration. But it it seems like those uh, those questions about Jewish identity are being investigated in the Jewish studies department. It yes, is, yeah. right? it's not being um, marginalized, excluded. There's there's room to study that. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. I I I agree. There's there's tremendous and very valuable research that's been conducted and is currently been conducted on Jewish identity. What I found is that almost every single study is is that inward looking kind. Um, you know, how does you know what's one's Jewish practice? What is one's Jewish level of observance or education or social affiliation, and not and not that much vis-a-vis -vis, um, the non-Jewish world in, in the context of the non-Jewish world, and that's as opposed to uh, as opposed to um, uh, black feminist theory, to use one example, um, uh, where. Where, where black feminists have, have done major work in examining um, what it is to be a black, a, a woman within black society and a black person uh, within white society. That, that uh, white hegemony, white male hegemony, and then and how they feel disadvantaged from numerous ends and that, that, that uh, double helix of discrimination that um, Bell Hooks talked about. But, um, uh, but within, within Jewish identity research or Jewish women's identity research, you, you can see a lot of research about you know, um, egalitarian prayer, Jew, uh, Jewish women in the synagogue, Jewish women in communal life, uh, comparing it to earlier parts of the century and contemporary, it's all very, very important and valuable. Um, but it, uh, but there's Latin, perhaps in the past year or so, uh, there are, have been a, a few more studies that have emerged, but not, not that many that I had seen at the point that I was developing this. Thank you. Yes. When you say Jewish women and Jewish feminists, is there a difference, or is it? Um, yes. Yes. So I, when do you use one and not the other, or, or does it make a difference, or like because I, I don't I'm not following. Um, well, I, in this paper, uh, yeah. I guess when I used the term Jewish feminists, I was referring to the the women who were. Uh, who were actively involved in the women's movement, in the feminist movement, women's liberation movement, uh, either as uh, as activists or as theorists, um, and and the list is uh, Jews uh, played a major major role as theorists from uh, from Betty Friedan and onward. And, and the challenge for today. What do you mean? What, what challenge is there for today for the feminists, the Jewish feminists? Uh, it, it, it depends uh, whom you ask. Whom you ask if, if that woman is speaking about uh, her challenges within, the, within Jewish life, in, within, uh, within the synagogue, or, or family roles, or so on, or um, or in rabbinical law, there's certainly challenges to to Jewish women. Or if they're talking about the challenges to women in in general mainstream society. Question: Yeah, I'm wondering if you find this issue also in other religions, like religious settings, like for Muslim women in academia, and if there's some parallel to be made. Uh, because if you look at it from a religious perspective, but I think with um, 
in Judaism always it's it's that there's so many different um, facets of it. There's the race, there's the religion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I've not I'm not able to answer with respect to different um, different descent groups of women in academia, but I know there are huge bodies, huge bodies, considerable bodies of literature. In addition to black feminist literature, there's Hispanic feminist literature, there's Indian um, feminist literature, Pakistani. There's uh, there's a very um, healthy and noteworthy Iranian feminist movement, uh, and um, and in certain sections of the Muslim world, there's um, there are Christian feminists. With the, uh, who try to negotiate um, also their religion and, and uh, their roles within the religion as and and uh, in family. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of there's lots of grounds for comparison for us. Have you looked at feminism in Israel? And um... mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, absolutely, although this, this paper doesn't doesn't deal with it, mm -hmm. but uh, but you know, women in Israel face there are many challenges and there are many uh, and there's much uh, there's much progress. Are you saying that Jewish women don't identify as Jewish women? They more identify as women as part of a general category? Uh, if, if, that, if that's what came across, that's not what I meant to okay. say. I was saying that we all have multiple identities. Yeah, well, what would be an outward-looking uh, focus? You mentioned inward-looking, but I'm not sure what that is exactly. So what would be an outward-looking focus? That's the, that's the that's the perspective that I that I want to really define much more. Yes. This, this meeting this, this meeting is under the aegis of ISGAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Antisemitism. I'm just wondering what your talk, what is the connection between your talk and global and the study of global antisemitism? If any, I mean there is, but how would you uh, explain the, the connection? Uh, I think that that looking into You know, as, as I was mentioning, there's many different aspects of identity studies. It's individual and family and occupational and ethnic and gender and, and all sorts. Uh, there's another aspect called uh, negative identity studies. And that's, uh, that's where a certain group um, internalizes the negative stereotypes about them made within made by people who are racist. Um, and uh, anti-Semitism is, is a form of racism. So I'm, I'm posing the question, and uh, maybe we'll close with, with this. I'm closing the question of whether this omission, or to what degree does this omission of academics, this, the self-censorship, the self-censorship of these academics in choosing their areas of research for whatever reasons they were they were guided away from this and you know this seemed like a valid area of research and this was you know more ghettoized and not a real area of research for, for many many people of, of the age group that I studied. It's only within that age group that you're talking yeah. about. Yeah and um, to what degree might this have been an aspect of, of negative identity uh, and, and other questions remain today. Uh, when you when you look at uh, what uh, what campus life is today in North America, mm -hmm. and uh, and there there are academics who who speak out, but but really very 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 few. Mm -hmm. What what are their reasons and their motivations um, for uh, for their silence or their rationalization? of what's going on and what, uh, to what degree have they internalized uh, or are, have been intimidated from speaking out, in a nutshell. Will you study that issue? I hope.
hope to. Okay. <laughs> It's like the internalization of that dual identity and of the libel of um, dual, dual loyalty. <clears throat> As an example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Very, very interesting.